Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Robert T. Gardner Jr. about utilizing emotional intelligence to improve self-esteem, self-awareness, resilience, and self-love. Robert T. Gardner, Jr., welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's my pleasure. and Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited for this conversation. You're joining us from the East Coast. I'm here in Utah on this beautiful day, and it's it's just a pleasure to be with you. Today, we're going to be focusing on something that I think fits really well with your unique interdisciplinary background. I'll share that with listeners here in just a moment. Um, but you, you have a lot of experience uh, working with organizations uh, in an HR leadership capacity to, to help them be more effective, uh, but you also have have done uh, work around uh, the social work field and counseling and, and helping others um, to be their best selves. So today we're going to focus on utilizing emotional intelligence to improve self-esteem, self-awareness, resilience, and self-love. Uh, but we're going to do that from an organizational perspective. We're going to do that from a leadership and people management perspective with the goal of trying to understand how leaders can best do that for themselves and then model healthy behaviors for their people and create a safe space where everyone uh, can have their needs met uh, and can ultimately uh, thrive within an organizational and team setting. As we get started, I wanted to share Robert's bio with everybody. Robert T. Gardner Jr. is an experienced human resource professional, licensed social worker, author, and relationship change agent who is ahead of his time. He believes that all good things work best from the inside out, and that would include us as human beings. Robert has a BA degree in political science from Fordham University, a master's degree in labor relations and human resource management from NYU, and a master's of social work from Rutgers University. With his advanced degrees in both human resources and social work, Robert has advised and consulted corporate leaders on a myriad of issues related to employment law. He has created management training programs for labor and management relations and progressive discipline. As a therapist, he is he is an agent for change regarding unhealthy relationships. For the past 10 years, Robert has created and facilitated educational programs that teach people how to ameliorate their emotional intelligence in an effective way to improve their self-esteem, self-awareness, resilience, and most of all, their self-love. His work in these areas are part of his endeavor to diminish domestic violence, bullying, and retaliatory behaviors in the workplace. Uh, and you're currently in a doctoral program, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I'm a student at Yeshiva University. That's wonderful. What a wonderful background. Thank you for joining us. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on into the conversation? No, I, I think you've said it all. If I said another word, uh, I might bore the audience. <laughs> so, Well, such, with such a rich background, I, I think it's, it's great to be able to share that with listeners. Um, so let's dive right on in. I mean, you, you have a, a really nice... Um, amalgamation of experience in, in academic training, uh, professional experience and training. Uh, and, and I actually, I think social work and HR go really well together. Uh, it's kind of a joke in my family. Most of my family, I come from a large family, eight children in my family. Um, my dad's a therapist, my mom's a social worker. And then most of my family are social workers or therapists in one way or another. And then there's me and I'm the HR guy. Uh, and so the joke in the family is, you know, I'm kind of the, the weird black sheep. I'm, I do HR, but I, I try to tell them, like, I think it's pretty much the same stuff, right? It's just, they're doing it, you know, 
with people in their homes and people out in their communities. I'm doing it within an organizational setting, but we deal with the same types of issues. And the, the reality is people are messy, people are complex, you get people together and challenging situations happen. And so, you know, HR, organizational leadership, people management, it's all about how uh, to best handle those situations, help individuals to thrive, help them to maximize their potential. And as leaders, first and foremost, we need to be healthy. And then we need to be able to model that healthiness, that behavior, the, those actions, those attitudes. We need to model that and create a safe space for our people to thrive. Uh, so, you know, I, I feel like HR is largely social work within an organizational setting. Um, I, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I totally agree with you, you know, in many ways, you know, one thing about human resources before I respond to that, you know, in in the old days, if you will, 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, people kind of evolved into human resources. They were not, they usually not trained in human resources. They may be, say, a secretary or helping in some other areas, and then uh, evolve into human resources and become human resources managers and subsequently uh, HR directors and so on and so forth. But now you have SHRM with all these certifications because it has been recognized that, you know, many people in years past who work in human resources were not specifically trained or educated in human resources. So unlike those individuals, I actually have been trained in human resources in that I have a master's degree in human resources and labor relations from NYU. And so with that, with that training, with that insight, that education, I always brought a like a, a wholesome perspective to human resources, where, you know, things like work towards win-win resolutions. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think, we, you know, we had win-win, oh, be reasonable and, you, you know, be reasonable in the way you resolve situations or the way you handle situations. Um, so there's a, there was a different perspective to my understanding. Also, another key one was, you know, do not use discipline to punish, but use discipline to correct behavior. And with this, without the training, you know, managers and leaders, they tend to weaponize discipline. And it's more like um, I'm the boss and, you know, I, I manage by fear, you know, lots of managers at the, at the behest and mistakes of organizations do not, they, we, we tend to promote the most technical person and that, you know, that person tends to lack human relations skills and abilities. So they don't know how to manage, they, uh, you know, they tend to, uh, be more intimidating, and not not that they're mean people, but in many ways they just don't know any better. So, but to I said all of that to answer your question. Now that I also have a master's degree in social work, at the time that I worked as an HR professional, I didn't have the master's in social work, but I brought the insightful skill set as a trained HR person that speaks to what you're talking about, how social work and human resources kind of overlap. And now as a, as a social worker and an experienced human resources person, I can definitely see how it works together because resolving conflicts and disputes, there's always somebody who presses harder, who, who's more angry, and you have to work through those issues and understand that, hey, you know, this person, let's say a person who's sick calls out sick a lot, and, and we look to discipline or correct their behavior. But there are times if you explore further on that situation, that person may have personal problems. So we have to look to not only correct the behavior, but address the issues that may be affecting you know, one's ability to perform his or her job. And just one final point, as I hope I answered your question. My my boss, you know, 
on, on one of my best jobs at the New York Blood Center, he had an MBA and a master's in social work as well. He wasn't a practicing social worker, but he brought a softer kind of touch to human resources, you know, as the leader. And we worked very well together as a team. But I think it's the training that I had that really, you know, brought that that HR professional in a more wholesome social work, you know, fashion, as you described. Yeah, thank you. I mean, there's so much there that you said uh, that we could probably take hours to unpack. Uh, but I, but I agree. I agree with your approach. I, you know, fear-based leadership, authoritarian control um, types of styles of leadership tend to not work very well. They don't sustain high levels of performance. They don't engender commitment and engagement from from your people. Uh, and and I don't. I agree. I don't think most people. There are some bad eggs, but I, I think most people um, are well-intentioned, but they don't know any better. They're not trained. They don't understand how to do these things. Um, they don't know how to use corrective action and performance management, you know, as a developmental tool, as opposed to some sort of a carrot and stick kind of a bludgeoning kind of fear-based tactic. Uh, and so you, you end up with a lot of problems in organizations that are perpetuated by well-meaning, but not terribly informed or very skillful people <laughs> um, because they haven't been trained in it. They don't know the nuances of it. And, and they're just doing the best they know how uh, based largely on what they've seen other people do around them uh, and what their experiences have been in the past. And so that's just the reality of it. And I think that's, uh, it's good for us to recognize that, to have a little bit of patience and a little bit of uh, empathy and compassion for, for leaders. Leadership is really tough work. Um, but that doesn't let us off the hook. That means we still have to develop ourselves and we have to uh, put in the time and the energy to try to understand and learn those things so that we can be more effective uh, and, and ultimately lead better teams, more healthy teams, teams that are going to be able to thrive. And that brings us in really to what I want to focus on the rest with the rest of our time together today. Um, you know, there's this idea of emotional intelligence. We've talked about that quite a bit on this podcast before. Um, so I don't know we need to rehash that uh, in any great detail, but emotional intelligence is really key, I think, for any individual who's trying to uh, work with other people, whether that's in a home setting, in a domestic setting, whether that's in a community situation, a community organization, or if that's in the workplace, we need emotional intelligence to be able to function well with, with people from diverse backgrounds, people who think differently than us, act differently than us, uh, and, and so forth. And, and so emotional intelligence is hugely important. Um, but we can leverage emotional intelligence as we develop that capability within ourselves. We can leverage that to improve our self-esteem, our self-awareness, our, our resiliency, our grit, and ultimately our self-love. So let's let's dive into those and talk about that more specifically. Um, when you talk about that with clients, whether it's as a therapist, whether uh, a social worker, or in, in more of an HR kind of a context, why, why is that self-esteem, that self-awareness, that resilience, why is that so key to people being able to thrive uh, in life and in the workplace? I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Well, that, 
that that is so important and it, it kind of speaks to what you were talking about how people uh manage by fear and and so on and so forth what happens is our adult adult dysfunction stems from our childhood issues and that spills over into our relationships that's why the i'm talking about our intimate relationships the, our, the divorce rate is 50 percent the first time 64 percent the second and 71 percent the third time so i said that to say that is as much as the divorce rate is high in relationships the same thing is true at work we bring our unresolved childhood issues into the workplace and we manage like that you know people you know you, you've ever been around a boss who yells and screams or there are bosses who don't trust, you know, their staff or their or the say their assistant director or the VP under them because they have trust issues. They lack um, self-esteem. They lack uh, feeling insecure. All of these issues, the same issues that lead to divorce in marriage are the same issues that lead to turbulence or or what can I say just uh, work environments that are not positive not um, you know when you think about why people come back to work and shoot everybody because the, even the staff members that's a gross lack of emotional intelligence but to to answer your questions about leadership and why is this so important because see, when you, when you have good self-esteem, then you tend to feel good. And when you feel good, you see life differently. You see life more, you know, through a brighter lens, if you will. You tend to trust people more. You tend to be a better team player. And those type of people tend to rally the troops, you, you know, build uh, better, better relationships at work. You know, I, I tell people, one time I started a new job and my, my boss, you know, the first day he came into the office, he said, uh, you know, are you going to be loyal to me? And when, you know, I was, I was much younger. And when I heard that question, are you going to be loyal to me? See, loyalty is not something you ask for. And the way I see that from an HR perspective, if you're asking me to be loyal to me, what you're really saying is you're going to be doing some things that I need to cover for you or, or lie about in order to, you know, for you to, to, to stay out of trouble. So you don't ask for loyalty. If anybody asks you for loyalty, that's, that should send up a red flag. The way- hey, Can I just comment on that point? Because that, that's very well said. I, I'm not sure I've ever heard anyone describe it quite that way, but I completely agree. And I think, I think the whole loyalty thing is insidious. Uh, it's toxic. And I have seen it so many times and a lot of times it goes, it's kind of an undercurrent, right? It's, it's, it's a unspoken understanding that people need, demand that kind of loyalty. And if you give it, you're safe. If you don't give it, you know, you're out, you're going to be retaliated right. against. And, and it, it, it really is insidious. It's, it's really disgusting. And we, we need to avoid, uh, you know, if we become loyal to somebody because they have earned our loyalty, because they have earned our trust, because they are a great person to work with, and we we genuinely revere them and care for them and, and, and want to be loyal to them, great. Like, if we can have an environment where, where people are loyal to the company and committed to the company and, and committed to the to their leader because it's earned, because they're a great person that is deserving of that kind of commitment, fantastic. But if, if you're ever in a situation where it's just like you... The, the expectations you have to be loyal and if you're not loyal you're out that is toxic it's insidious and and that needs to be avoided at all costs if I, that is a huge red flag and if i ever see anyone who who even implies that kind of uh, loyalty expectation uh i i want to run away from that well exactly so so in the circumstance you know i'm a new hire i'm number two i i said yes in, in, you know, in the context of keeping the job, but there's no way I'm going, you know, if something's wrong, you know, I'm a, I'm a person, a man of integrity, you, you understand? So I'm going to tell the truth, 
you know, the way the truth should be told. So I'm not going to be loyal in that regard. So with regard to leadership, when our leaders have good self-esteem, good self-awareness, um, they, they, they come, you know, as leaders that are more wholesome. And so they don't have to ask for loyalty because when, when a person feels good about him or herself, then they are good to others. People who do not feel good about themselves are not going to be good to others. If I'm, if I'm still angry about what happened to me 20 years ago when I was a child or I feel, felt abandoned or maybe I was violated by a family member um, you know, as a child, those issues come with us to work. They come with us to our, you know, in our relationships, in our adult relationships, in our friendships. So now you're managing and you're running departments or, or even thinking about running the United States and you're asking for loyalty. That says that you're going to be doing some things that I need to cover for you that I'm not going to agree with and I can't not be loyal to you. So the point is, is that when you when you have good self-esteem, good emotional intelligence, like self-awareness, you're able to regulate your emotions. You know, what first of all, I think it's important I sh we should define what is emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is your ability to man to be intelligent with your emotions. And that means that you are aware of how you behave under certain circumstances, what might press your buttons, what might not press your buttons. Um, you also are able to regulate your emotions instead of uh, having knee jerk impulsive reactions when, when you're under pressure, when you're in the crisis, instead of feeling, you stop to think. That's how you regulate your emotions. You think about what's happening. And when you think about what's happening, more than likely you'll get a better outcome as opposed to acting on your feelings. Uh, people who, um, who are emotional intelligent, they're also empathetic. And empathetic empathy is different from sympathy. Sympathy is, you know, I feel sorry for you. It's so terrible. Empathy means I can get right there with you about your feelings and understand, you know, what you're going through and be supportive without saying a word, but you know that that I'm there. Uh, so, so emotional intelligent to have emotionally intelligent managers and staff is really that's in demand today. That's why, you know, now to get a job, you have to take personality tests as opposed to tell me about your last 10 years on, on your resume, because that doesn't really tell the employer anything about how you handle difficult situations, how you deal with difficult people, how you handle stress, and, and so on and so forth. So emos emotionally intelligent managers, leaders, and employees, staff members, just make for a more wholesome uh, team, I don't even want to say family type of environment because family is not always, you know, everybody in your family is not emotionally intelligent. So what, what's important though for leaders, if when your leader is emotionally fit, as I call it, you'll have a, a much more enjoyable work experience because you'll be given the latitude to, to do your job. Uh, uh, him or her will trust you. Um, they can rely on you. You can rely on them. And there's no pressure to feel like you have to be loyal to somebody who might not only ruin their career, but yours yeah. as well, while you're in the midst of being loyal to them. Yeah. I hope yeah. I answered your question. Yeah. I, you know, I really appreciate that perspective. And I think it's kind of come up a couple of times in your comments, and that is the level of insecurity that some people have. And where does that come from? It comes from their past experiences, their past trauma, their childhood, their previous workplace, you know, environments. Um, ultimately, there are a lot of leaders out there that because of technical skill, uh, or whatever, they, they end up getting promoted, they find themselves in a position of leadership and responsibility over other people. And they're quite insecure. Uh, they, they don't have a high level of emotional intelligence. Uh, they don't have a high level of self-esteem. Um, they, they perhaps have some resilience, um, but they lack the self-awareness. And 
And so they're insecure because they understand they're vulnerable. And that's why they demand things like loyalty. That's why they use fear-based and controlling tactics because they're insecure. Uh, secure individuals don't need to lead that way. They, they can foster mutual accountability and trust and genuine relationships of trust with their people and, and everyone can thrive. And so, like you said, emotional intelligence is key. We absolutely need to foster that within ourselves. We also need to help our people recognize that need for them in their own careers, their own personal development to be able to do that also. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to make, this is, this is crucial also, and I mentioned it earlier, when individuals are promoted, they need to be trained. That's, that is a mistake that many organizations make. They promote people, but they fail to train them in, as far as how to supervise. You know, in order to, to manage people, you need a management style. Like, for instance, my management style is participatory management. That means that with my staff, when we have when there's decisions to be made, I allow this the staff, we they participate in the decision making process. Even though I have the final say, the idea is everybody's on board and the staff feels more involved, they feel more respected, and they feel like more a part of the team because they were involved in the process that led to the decisions that uh, promotes, it boosts morale, it reduces turnover, and a happy employee is a productive employee. So it's important that even, even if you do not get the training at work, if you're promoted into a new position, you nowadays you can Google management styles to see which one fits your personality type. And then that way, if you have a style of management, the, the other style of management without a per, uh, management style is what I call we manage by fear. I'm the boss, you'll do what I say, or you'll yeah. get fired, which is very ineffective. So new, new promote, you know, people who are promoted need to be trained and, and how to develop a management style so that they can work more effectively and appropriately and in a, a cultural, culturally competent manner with, with people from all walks of life. Yeah. Amen. Well said. Well, Robert, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today. The time has flown by. I imagine we could continue on and on. There's a lot to discuss here. But before we close for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Okay, well, thank you very much. It was truly a pleasure. And they say time flies when you're having fun. But I'd like to say, you can get in touch with me. I have a website, relationshipreadiness.org. I have my own business uh, and I brand the term relationship readiness. And that has a lot to do with the, the idea that we as humans need to have good relationships with ourselves before we have relationships with other people. So I'm in the business of helping people to become relationship ready by way of emotional intelligence training, uh, self-esteem. Also, I do uh, consulting, employee relations consultants, consulting, I'm sorry, for businesses of all sizes. I also have a podcast. The name of my podcast is called Station B-O-B, which stands for you, where you listen to become the best of your being in life, love, and work. And I can discuss all of those subjects because of my background in human resources and, and social work and my life experiences. And thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robert. It has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out to get connected, find out more about Rob, what Robert can do for you. Check out his podcast. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership. Ordinary, everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? 
Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.